and get started. Hello, everybody. I'm Hunter Ohanian, and I'm the director of the Stonewall Nashie Museum and Archives here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And the temperature is about 83 degrees right now for those of you who are in other parts of the country. Um, but anyway, I want you all to say hello to Jeff Nagel. Jeff, say hi. Hello. Nice to see you. Um, just to, uh, before we get started on tonight's talk, I want to tell everybody a little bit about Stonewall. Uh, we've been around for 47 years, maybe 48 years now. We're located here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we have one of the largest LGBTQ libraries in the world. There are over 28,000 volumes in our library, all organized under the Library of Congress system. And in our archive, uh, we have 2,700 linear feet of material right now. And if you want to imagine what that's like, just imagine going up one side of the Empire State Building and then all the way down the other. And uh, that is a lot of archival information. Best, best guess we can tell you is that there are over 6 million pages of LGBTQ history in the archive. And so it's, it's phenomenal. Um, it mostly is from uh, the, I would say primarily from 1970 to the present day, although we certainly have a pretty deep bench from the 1950s. We have about, I mean, certainly published um, uh, journals, things from Mattachine and One and D Daughters of Politis. We have all those, but we also have a lot of meeting minutes and notes from those publications and those organizations as well, too. And we have some historic items uh, going back to Walt Whitman and uh, and many others as well, too. But our, our real sort of bit, bread and butter is um, the American gay cultural scene in the 70s, 80s, 90s uh, to the present day. Um, and so you can find out everything about us uh, through stonewall-museum.org. And you can understand about our archives and our library and programming that we do. Uh, what you're witnessing tonight is a new series that we started in the beginning of COVID back in May. This might be episode number 32 or 33. We do them for an hour uh, once a week and they're all videotaped. And uh, they are on Facebook as well too. We're live on Facebook. So hello to all of our friends on Facebook. You can friend us there as well too. And uh, we're ha happy to have uh, all of you. Um, if you have friends who are interested in seeing tonight's talk, it is being re recorded. Uh, and so uh, it will be posted on our website at stonewall-museum.org, as I said, uh, probably tomorrow or the next day it will be up. Uh, let's say hello to Emery Grant, my deputy director. Emery, are you back there somewhere? He's behind the scenes. Hello, Emery. Say Thank hi you. to everybody. Thank you, Jeffrey, for joining us. And. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Emery. Emery is um, a bit behind the scenes here, making sure everything runs smoothly and that uh, I keep my fingers off the keyboard and not screw too many things up. Uh, one last thing I want to say is that uh, we do a lot of exhibitions at Stonewall. Uh, we've been doing those for about 20 years of our of our um, 50 year history. Uh, right now we have two exhibitions up. One is called Queers at Home, uh, which comes from our archives. And it's really looking about gay domestic life through the serials and, and, and evidence that we find in our archives. Uh, so we're seeing everything from Liberace's house to what gay men thought would be the ideal uh, spread with uh, track lighting and industrial carpeting. Um, in, uh, in the early 1970s and Blue Boy magazine to engagement pictures in the 1950s. And, uh, and so it really is a wonderful show. You can actually see a curated talk of that show by going to the website as well as all the, uh, as well as the images of all the objects in that show. And then tomorrow we're opening an exhibition that will be at six o'clock and that will be virtual as well too. And it will be with curator Megan Kent, who is the chief curator at the Hollywood Center for Arts and Culture. And it's called Off Our Backs, Early Lesbian Publications from the 1950s to 2000. And so Megan has done an amazing job and the show looks really beautiful. And so I'm really excited uh, to hear her talk to tomorrow night. So to understand everything that we do, uh, feel free to sign up for our newsletter. Um, and you can do that through the website. We send it out once a week. We don't ask for money too many times. Uh, so uh, we, we don't bug you, but of course we're a nonprofit like everybody. So we love all the support uh, that we get from people around the country as well too. So I think that's the, um, 
that is the business I have to get out of way. And so, Jeff, let's talk to you. And um, where are we finding you this evening? I'm in State College, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Penn State University. So I'm right in the smack center of Pennsylvania with lots of snow between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. How long have you been in State College? This is year four. I had to think about it. Yeah. This is, are this you enjoying first. it? I am. Uh, Pennsylvania is really beautiful. I grew up in Ohio. Uh, my partner's from Texas, so it's been more of a transition uh, for her. But I, I like the Midwest. I like having four seasons. And when I get to be inside, even I like snow. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, and so um, let's let everybody understand a little bit about your background here. And um, so, uh, Jeff, as you say, you're a doctoral candidate in rhetoric in the Department of Communication Arts and Sciences at Penn State University. And, and your work focuses primarily on gay and lesbian activism in the 1950s and 60s, uh, including studies of the Mattachine Society, the Daughters of Belitis. And you've also examined public speech and writings on individuals in this period, including uh, Frank Kemeny, Jack Nichols, who we'll speak about tonight, Barbara mm -hmm. Giddings. Um, and your dissertation is on queering absence, uh, the rhetoric of the homophile movement. And um, so I think, you know, it's a wonderful uh, segue for, for us, uh, for an organization that really looks at, um, I've lost everything here. Let's go back over to that screen. Um, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for, for us to have a conversation with, with you since uh, you really are in the business um, from an academic standpoint of sort of thinking about how archives uh, reflect history and, and particularly in the LGBTQ world. And so let me, my first question for you is, how did you get involved in this business? How, how was it that your interest um, in the early parts of the gay movement and writing and speech about that could come about? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's always a mixture of things about where you find yourself and what interests you. I did debate in high school and college, and one of my collegiate debate partners was really into queer theory. And that's where I first started reading people like Sarah Ahmed, Judith Butler. Uh, this is an undergrad, because I was a political science major because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I picked sort of a center of the road uh, degree. And then from there, I started doing more and more research, and I kept reading post Stonewall. And I was like, well, what's post Stonewall? What does that mean? Uh, so obviously starting to read, trying to educate myself more about uh, gay history and queer history. And then as I went to graduate school, which again was a choice mostly because I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, there is already quite a bit of work done in our discipline about the 70s, 80s and on. I think groups like uh, Act Up, Queer Nation, the Lesbian Avengers, they're flashy and they're substantive and they're controversial. Larry Kramer is a great example of these kinds of um, people that are really fun to write about. And so I found myself interested in the people that came before them, most of whom who, uh, you know, I think a lot of these groups in the 70s and 80s spent a lot of their time talking about how ineffective and bad the 1950s and 1960s groups were, like the Daughters of Belitis, like the Madison Society. Uh, and I just kept reading. And the more I was reading about them, the more fascinated I was. And I couldn't believe nobody was writing about all this stuff that was happening. And so, uh, you know, I felt like, wow, I really have something interesting I can say here. And I, I can write and read about things that, I don't want to say no one's doing this work, but it is not as popular of an area of focus as uh, some of the more later movements are. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And, and uh, I think what's interesting about it, of course, is that there are those of us who are very interested <laughs> and, we, and there is a circle of us who, who find this to be a fascinating period of time. And I don't know about you, but for me as a gay man, of course, there's, there's that part of the, the lens to look, look at. But there's also about, there's such an amazing civil rights story in what it is that we do and 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 how we examine this stuff and present it and bring it forward to to ourselves and to our peers in another generation the stuff that we work on transcends race and gender and religion and and ethnicity it's just it's amazing how it applies to so many different people 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, to there's a real symmetry between some of the work that the homophile movement was doing in the 50s and 60s, and some of the work that archives and archivists and people examining archives are doing today. There's this real emphasis on bringing things to light uh, and really making that complicated. And of course, it's some of what we're going to talk about tonight is that that's not, it's not as simple as just bringing everything to light and then there it is self-evident. That's not often uh, how it works. But, you know, these early groups came out of a time where post-World War II, there was really this moment of both backlash, but also realization that there's a lot more public gay life than people uh, may have originally thought. And for a lot of uh, gay men, and the story of, uh, of lesbian women in the United States post-World War II is similar, but a little bit different. They have a lot more flexibility during World War II and then a much harsher crackdown after. But for gay men especially, the early 1950s uh, really marks like a lot of centralization in the urban in, in urban environments uh, and a realization that there might actually be uh, a need and a desire for political activism. Yeah, and and I think that's great. And I think also um, to to think about too about uh, I'm always struck and impressed and and humbled when I find rural gay people who are fighting those fights, both uh, women and men um, in the rural communities as well, because for many of us, certainly for, for me, I thought this was something that, you know, you had to be living in the West Village or you had to be living in San Francisco or you had to be living in the South End in Boston. But those that, uh, there is such an amazing queer community in rural America that, that are, church going that are, 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 are conservative, not in a bad way, but conservative in, in a way that sort of the traditional red, white, and blue apple pie American life mm -hmm. um, that, but yet they're, they're queer to their hearts, uh, but they just happen to be rural. And, and I, find, I find that community to be hugely fascinating. Yeah, and one of the struggles with communities like that um, is that they, they tend not to leave as much archival residue, right? There's not as many objects for us to study later on. And of course, some of the goal is to find things that no one's talking about or no one has and talk about them. But also, I mean, there's a very real tendency to study what's there. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of uh, my the larger arguments in my dissertation is that even though we have this impulse to study what's there, that oftentimes, particularly for queer life, uh, studying what's not there uh, is a more difficult question, but one that is perhaps more pressing, uh, yeah, particularly for these groups that are, are really, a lot of their advocacy is rooted around, right, rights to, we're here, but also don't ask us any questions, privacy is important, or we're going to go be in a public demonstration and wear masks, or use pseudonyms, right, there's all, there's this tension, uh, and then of course later on, uh, particularly with the rise of AIDS, right, you see ACT UP starting to use language like silence equals death, uh, which in some ways is a direct response to some of the strategies of the homophile movement. Yeah, and, and of course, that's all, all that stuff is really great. And, and, and the sense also, you know, you can, go, you can go back and look at certain individuals and, and now perhaps in their 80s and 90s, um, but you can look at somebody like Gorbit Vidal, of course, who's no, no longer here, or even Liberace or even um, James Baldwin, even though they might have accepted, well, Liberace didn't, but they might have publicly accepted the fact that they had affection for a same-sex individual, or that they might have participated in same-sex um, emotional acts, they didn't want to be called gay. They mm -hmm. didn't want to be, they didn't want that label on them. And that was a major part of how they defined themselves, as opposed to the post-Stonewall years, where it was a period of time in which we were we were encouraged to own it and to have pride in it, as opposed to those who didn't have pride into it or pride about it earlier. Absolutely. And, well, and you know, as a as a scholar of communication, one of the things that is really fascinating is the struggle that these groups had in developing a language for themselves. I mean, we use the word homophile movement for folks that aren't deep in the history of the gay rights movement. These people, for the most part, did not identify themselves as gay um, or lesbian. That happens like starting in the mid 1960s. Certainly, they would not have described themselves as queer. Uh, that's really a term that arises in the 1970s. And so, for them, homophile signaled right love of the same. Oh, it's philia. It's love. It's not about sex, right? It's this sort of more 
palatable and passive and also homophile could uh, describe um, allies as well as actual individuals uh, engaging in whatever kind of acts wanted to be defined. I mean, at this time period, uh, sodomy laws and obscenity laws and things like that were, were the focus of these groups were not particularly interested in defining for themselves for the most part what constituted gay life, uh, but they were interested in fighting those that were trying to legislate those definitions. Yes, I, I agree with all that. And also for all of you who are watching, uh, please feel free to throw your comments and your questions in either the Q&A or the chat, and we will get to those as we go through here. But as you have ideas or comments, please uh, throw them up and we will, I see some coming in here. And so we will certainly get to all of those as we go forward. So let's do a few definitional things. I mean, you and I have got, I mean, you, you and I could actually do this once a week for t 10 weeks and <laughs> there's a lot to be said. Um, but so um, let's just be sure, uh, homophile movement, um, give people a 25 word definition of that. Yeah, the earliest public gay rights activism uh, it's started in the Madison Society is founded in 1953 in Los Angeles. The Daughters of Belitis, which is the lesbian organization, is founded in 1955 in San Francisco. And that's pretty much considered the origin point. It goes right up until basically the summer of 1969 with Stonewall. And after that, those groups pretty much get forced out of uh, power and cease to become relevant by like the early 1970s. There's just no membership anymore. So, and again, I think history is, of course, an important part of all this stuff. And so we think about World War, World War II ending in 1945. And of course, Truman was the president by the end of World War II. And then Eisenhower, uh, I believe, was elected in 1950 and came into office in 1951. Uh, when was um, Executive Order 10693? Uh, was it 10693? What year was that? That, that, was that? was that signed in 1951, 1950? No, it must have been 1952 or 53. Yeah, it's. I think it's right around. It's right around then. I don't remember exactly. Um, and that is also one of the origin points for a lot of the later activism that happens. Is um, Franklin Kemeny, who you who mentioned already, has a Supreme Court case in the early 1960s because he is working for the State Department and uh, gets fired because he's caught. I don't think he's even formally charged, but he is arrest. He's detained on suspicion of uh, cruising. Uh, somewhere in California, and his boss finds out and fires him. And so a lot of the early activism too, I mean, even though these people called themselves militants, their big goal was to go be able to work for the State Department. Uh, <laughs> and, and also just uh, to, to make sure that we're making the distinctions here, when they went out and demonstrated and picketed, they put their suits on, okay. their little skinny ties, the women had their hair done perfectly. I right. mean, they were not going to be culturally upsetting. They were going to try to fit in as much as they possibly could. They may have been holding signs that say we deserve our rights too, but but they were going to look like something right out of uh, Leave it to be Beaver. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Sunday best, no hand holding. Uh, you were not allowed to talk to the media unless if you'd been approved by one of the organizers. Uh, signs were produced by the organizers and handed out. You didn't bring your own material and you marched silently in a circle uh, in places like uh, in Philadelphia or the annual reminder, I think is the most famous one. It's, it goes on for four or five years. Every 4th of July, they'd stand uh, in front of Independence Hall and say, you know, we're citizens too. It was the annual reminder that gay people exist. I have um, actually, as we transition to some of our conversation, I have some images of the annual reminder and a couple of these other pickets. And some people will be able to see really how, it's funny, right? Because these are the radicals at the time, right. uh, but just sort of how conservative looking they are. Yeah. Uh, particularly yeah. considering this is for many people, the same time that like the Black Panthers and other groups like that are uh, organizing. Uh, yes. to, yeah, and, and so just going back to the executive order that I was, that I was speaking about, that was, that was in the early 50s was sort of the first time that the government, and in this case it was president and, and through an executive order, said that in the State Department first, and then ultimately it ended up being uh, throughout the federal government and certainly in the military, that you could not hire sexual deviants and by, and, and, or per perverts, and by definition, homosexuals fell in that c category. 
<laughs> so people were very much uh, aware of that. And just as a small side note, even though that was not followed uh, through all of the years, that executive order that Eisenhower signed was not actually specifically overturned until the o Obama administration. Mm -hmm. Obama actually signed an executive order in, I don't know what year, Jeff, you, you might know, but, um, but it was only, you know, it was, it, it, I think it was in his second term. Um, so it was probably only five, six, seven, eight years ago that he overturned that order that Eisenhower had, had, had put into place. But then also, so you have the executive order and then you have the next step, which is the McCarthy era. And, and which of course, many of us who went to school in the 60s and 70s and 80s, we heard about the Red Scare, but what we didn't hear about was the Lavender Scare. <laughs> yeah, which is uh, which predates and in many ways is not even really distinct so much as the Lavender Scare sort of transforms into the Red Scare. And I think um, uh, there's some conflation as well, right? When we're talking about the language in these executive orders about perversion that, uh, being a communist or being a homosexual or whatever else, these were for some groups considered to be uh, conflated, right? These are people that violate Americana and the American way of life. And so, of course, and there's also some irony there that they were afraid about uh, gay people being blackmailed in the State Department. But of right. course, the whole reason they would be blackmailed is because the State Department was already the ones Hunting, hunting them in the first place. If they were allowed to be openly gay, there wouldn't be anything to blackmail them about. Yes, so. <laughs> and, and of course, creating shame. I mean, you need to have something bad to be a victim. Either you have to commit a crime or you have to be something that you're worried about something else, someone else finding out a bit about it. And so they created the shame at that period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, anti-gay or anti-homosexual feelings have been around for much lo longer than the 20th century, but, but they certainly highlight like it. And I just want to say, when we see groups like the recent insurrection, or we see Q QAnon, we see stuff happening in 2020 or 2021, uh, folks, don't take your eye off the ball, because, you know, there are people today trying to do exactly the same thing. And FYI, too, they talked about kids being in danger. And then you saw it during the Anita Bryant years in the 1970s, that kids were at danger. And what do we hear QAnon and members of Congress saying right now, except kids are at danger. Oh yeah, everything from Pizzagate on, right? It's the global pedophilia conspiracy. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we, we do have a comment here and thank you very much for this, uh, that uh, Leslie re reports to us um, that that executive order was overturned in 2017. And so that's, that's really- wrong. Yeah. Hi, mom. <laughs> that, your mom? Uh -huh. Hi, Hi, mom. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Jeff's mom. Thank you for being such a good supporter. <laughs> All right. So we have a number. And so just so everybody knows, the way Jeff and I met is there was a, a donor here in Florida uh, who said that she had a fair number of papers from uh, about Jack Nichols. And she had befriended him in, in the last part of his life. He was here in Florida. So I went to visit her. And indeed, she had papers and early copies of one and different publications. And so I started doing some research. And I found Jeff's, um, Jeff's article, uh, Belonging in the Archives, Family, Affect, and Loss, and the Jack Nichols Papers, which, of course, where I had just brought all of this stuff into the archives. And there was this wonderful scholarly piece but published by Miss Michigan State University Press about Jack Nichols papers. I, I, I had to find him and <laughs> I had to talk to him because, and that's why we, we are here today. And so I just wanna thank you actually for the work that you're doing in that it allows uh, people to go out there and do the re research that they would want to. And, if, and, and we live in a society today in which we can actually find some of this, doubt, this stuff out and, and, and find peers out there to have these conversations with. Yeah, absolutely. The, the pandemic has made going to some physical archives more difficult, but uh, one of the big pushes in the last 10 or 15 years, I think, and you would probably be able to speak more to this than I would, is, is the digitizing of various archives. And so even some of this earlier material, like I think every issue of the latter uh, which was the Daughters of Belitis publication that ran for almost 20 years. Uh, I think it's like 18 or 19 years. They're, they're all digitized and you can find them online. 
as are uh, a lot of, for some of these you need a university account, but I think SAGE has a lot of primary source documents um, of these early movements, of course, uh, the Library of Congress, and uh, I believe you all have some things that are digitized, right? It's like, a, but of course the other problem is you have 27,000 linear feet or whatever, we said 2,700 linear feet, yeah. But yeah. I mean, the, the amount of labor it takes to digitize a lot of this stuff means that by and large, most of the archival work uh, and barring a, a large commitment of time and money is still going to be by going in and looking at the physical boxes. No question. And also there is, for the, those of you who've done some of this work, whether it's around this topic or others, we can all look at stuff online, but still it's, it's really valuable to be in the archives or to be in the library to be able to look at this work, to actually see the publication, to see what you have in front of you and actually look at it and to be able to smell it and feel it and uh, understand what the object is about. So we have a few topics that um, uh, we haven't even started yet. So we have a few <laughs> topics that we wanna talk about. And so the first one uh, that you and I talked about is the idea of history versus memory. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's the whole idea about um, what we remember, how archives uh, play a role in this, how, I mean, where the facts really lie, um, and, um, and how we, and how we uh, pull all this stuff to, together. So I'm gonna toss this over to you, Jeff, and ask you to, uh, to talk about this. Yeah, the, the question of history versus memory, uh, particularly sort of like social or what rhetoricians would call public memory, is really fascinating. If we think of history as being like the who, what, when, and where of things that happened, oftentimes rhetoric and then memory is the study of the how and the why of those things. And so I'm actually going to share my screen briefly because I think a really easy way to explain this difference is to uh, talk about the case of the Stonewall riots uh, themselves or the Stonewall Rebellion. I mean, even the naming of it is something of a fascination. So some of these pictures I've just grabbed, uh, right, the original Stonewall Rebellion uh, happens in the summer of 1969 uh, between uh, June 29th or 30th and then through July 3rd. And it's primarily a response by young uh, poor, predominantly non-white street kids at the bar scene in Greenwich Village in New York. And so the picture on the left, I think, is like from 1970 or 1971. Uh, the picture in the middle is, I think, on the second or third night. And then the picture on the right is uh, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who were uh, drag queens, women of color. They were, uh, these were the people that a lot of people either credit as being the first person to throw the brick or to talk, you know, to, to be there. There's some question about who was there, how many people, what were their roles? Uh, and so that's sort of questions of history, right? Who was there and what were those things? But then what, ha what starts to happen is that memory is where we sort of see like, what happened to these things. So this is, a, this is a screenshot and a poster from a movie a couple of years ago that was, I think, pretty well lambasted uh, called Stonewall. And their argument was basically that it was mostly uh, cis folks, that it, good looking white men, throwing bricks. It's like this weird, um, you know, sort of heroism story. And it's not to say that that's totally wrong, but the question of memory is really one of how are these things interpreted? What's emphasized? What's brought to the fore? And so uh, we can see that also in the ways that things like Stonewall are remembered. Uh, we've seen a real push in the last couple of years about uh, remembering that Stonewall was a riot. I'm sure folks have seen those stickers or other merchandise. I think in 2019, in response to the pride being too corporatized, there was like a counter pride parade in New York. And then uh, one other interesting uh, fact is that this statue on the left here is in uh, the Christopher Street Park, which is right near Stonewall and it's recognizing the sort of legacy of Stonewall. And so it's, you've got a gay couple and a lesbian couple. There was a lot of concern about them being uh, they appear to be cis, they're painted white, uh, there was concerns about what sort of memory work should even be done to remember Stonewall. And so when we're thinking about memory, we're thinking about issues in the present that are contesting images or events of the past. And so if history is the record, then memory is sort of how we relate to and deal with that history uh, today. 
there's a lot of scholarship about sort of the different ways that memory works, uh, whether it's rooted in psychology or not. That's uh, beyond what I study or, or, or am comfortable sort of like arguing about. But I think public memory, the way that we debate over these images, uh, including really even the ways that groups in the 70s or 80s were debating about what the homophile movement meant, is, uh, is absolutely the purview of memory scholars and, and dealing with this relationship between history and memory. You know, right, memory is related to history, but it's also a manipulation of it. Uh, and that manipulation does not always have to be um, nefarious, but it can equally just be uh, interested, uh, a lack of knowledge otherwise, right, as we learn. Um, and there are tons and tons of examples of how that works, but I thought Stonewall is a nice easy example. Most people are familiar with sort of the scaffolding of the event, um, but sort of arguing about how that translates is, a, is an ongoing one as well, right? The, the, the memory of Stonewall remains contested. And I think that that's, um, I think that that's a, a good point in, for us to be thinking about. And I say that as the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archive. And um, while we are a, a um, viable and vibrant gay queer archive, we have nothing to do with the, the specifics of what happened at the Stonewall Inn in um, 1969. We get calls, uh, we used to get more, we put something up on the website, which I think probably makes it easier for people, but we used to get a lot of, of uh, inquiries saying, so are you guys the keepers of everything that happened at the Stonewall event in 1969? And, you know, I would jokingly say, what do you think we have like the beer kegs? And do we have the, uh, do we have the cigarette machine? Do we have the bar stools? I mean, what is it that we have? Of course, we are not the museum of that event. And just so p people know, the, and I, the, the best way for, for me to say this is to go back to Obama and his second inaugural speech, where he talks about civil rights in the idea from Selma to Seneca Falls to Stonewall. Those are places and words um, that, that just uh, epitomize civil rights in those particular areas. So when we were founded in 1973, by a guy here in South Florida. He was, his name is Mark Silber, and he just simply wanted to put gay books together. And so he started building, it was a bookcase. And then, you know, it was a shelf and it was a case. And, and so he just called it the Stonewall Library at a time four years after the Stonewall Uprising, not because he was there, although he was from New York, but he was living in South Florida, but simply it was a word which meant civil rights to gay people. And that's why we have that name today. Yeah, absolutely. And one of my dissertation chapters even focuses on the evolving memory of Stonewall. Why does Stonewall, the event, the five, six nights become Stonewall? And it's interesting, right? It's, it's not the first gay riot. Uh, the Compton's Cafeteria riot in California is one example that's frequently mentioned as happening before. But one of the things that is so fascinating about Stonewall is that it really capitalizes on a lot of the force and activism that was happening in the homophile movement. So the annual reminder, which we've mentioned a couple of times, happens every 4th of July between 1965 and 1969. And then during the last one, basically, the Stonewall Rebellion, riot, whatever you want to call it, happens. And so in 1970, they shift the annual reminder from Philadelphia to New York. They call it Christopher Street Liberation Day. So it's not even still Stonewall, now it's the whole street. And they have a march. And then in 1971, they have a march. And now we've got gay pride parades. And that is rooted basically to the annual reminder picketing series turning into a uh, march, turning into a parade, and so on and so on. Yeah, no, and that's that's exactly how it, it happened. And the Christopher uh, Street uh, uh, parade was really something because there were so many gay men and women that were living in that part of the Westfit Village, or that really is the village as opposed to the Westfit Village. And, you know, you can go back and see some of those early uh, years the, in, in 70 and 71 and 72. And, you know, they, they were lucky 
to have a hundred people to show up for those things in those first years. And we're very fortunate. We have man, many of the flyers and ephemera for, from that stuff. And this is all really just as crude stuff and, you know, bad letter set and letters going this way and that way. And it's just, it's beautiful stuff because it was so, it was so um, intense and romantic and, and it was so heartfelt as to how they wanted to make this stuff happen. They wanted to make a change. But to reiterate what, what you said, you think about what happened then 50 years ago. And then it's, it, it didn't just happen in Philadelphia or New York. It is in every city on the planet. Yeah, well, and, and actually one of the last places uh, to start holding annual pride parades is San Francisco. And I forget who says this, but there's a quote somewhere from somebody that's like, I'm not gonna let a bunch of gay men from New York tell me about how to celebrate uh, you know, pride or gay life or whatever. And so, but I think with, by 1971 or 1972, there's already Christopher Street Liberation Day marches in, I think, Chicago. Um, I can't remember where else, but it, it starts to spread and, and grow from there. And what's also interesting is because original Stonewall takes place between June and July, the, the way the legend goes is that they flipped a coin to decide which month was going to be Pride Month uh, yeah. for the original groups about deciding. And of course, the other rumor, and maybe you have seen this as, as well too, but you know, I grew up in, in my early adult years in the 70s and 80s, um, hearing that a lot of the disruption at the Stonewall Inn in 1969 had to do with um, uh, Judy Garland's death and Judy Garland's f funeral. And I don't know, I I've certainly heard that over the years, but I've never heard any firsthand accounts that would actually say that was a motivating factor. We can look at the calendar and say, yes, those two things coincided on the calendar, but also there could, could have been a full moon or a new moon or something else. I mean, there could, could have been something else. Has your research led anything into the Judy Garland theory as well? I've I've seen I've seen it reported. I think uh, Martin Duberman and David Carter both uh, are very suspicious of that. There's no real evidence. And, and one of the things that's interesting too is that when we're talking about gay life at this period, and this is true today as well, that there's not really one community, uh, particularly at this time. The kinds of people that are in the homophile movement tend to be white, uh, more middle-aged, middle-class, well-educated. Um, and that's a lot of the people that were at the Judy Garland funeral. Um, but the street kids, primarily the people that are at the bars tend to be young kids who have moved to Greenwich Village because they, you know, don't, that's where they think gay life is. They tend to be young. A lot of them are homeless. A lot of them aren't white. And so I think it's Duberman who says that it's entirely possible that people were at both events, but there doesn't appear to be any linkage. And I think the most telling thing is that at the time, no one's making that connection. This isn't until much later where people say, hey, these two things happened about the same time. So yeah. you can't, I mean, you can never definitively say no, uh, but there doesn't really appear to be any evidence that they're connected. Although it's, I mean, it's a fun, uh, you know, coincidence. And, and, and again, that now goes to your point about the difference between history and memory and, and sort of how these narratives get changed. And I think, I think your point about your characterization of those original people who are upset, unless I, I do think factually what upset them on that June night was at that time, if it wasn't 50, it was probably 49 states in 1969 made sodomy illegal in those states. It's and, uh, 49 because Illinois rewrites the penal code in the early 1960s. So, but it, it was illegal in New York. And so not to be too graphic with regard to sodomy, but the definition of sodomy was simply anything that was not uh, married sex between a man and a woman. So it was anything that was going on sexually. And, and it, was even, it was even illegal for two members of the same sex to dance with each other. So, the, so, the mem so those that went to Stonewall, what was Stonewall as a, bar, as a bar at the time or as an establishment, it was a place that the mafia ran mm -hmm. that was illegal, even though it was there and it had a sign and it was open to the public, but, it, but that the police always had the ability to shut them down. We don't live in a world like that right now. Mm -hmm. We don't actually know those kinds, of, but, but gay bars 
were truly owned and operated by organized crime. And, and, and so it was because they felt so slighted by the fact like this just isn't fair. Why, why can people go to the Rainbow Room at Rockefeller Center or, or, you know, or any place else if they're straight, but we can't even dance with each other and we have to run the risk of, of, of being, being arrested um, because of what we're doing because somebody just doesn't like it at the moment that's what made people upset. Yeah, and the the bar scene especially, I think, you know, there's very clear risks uh, from going out into the bar scene. These are places that were frequently raided by police. Drinks are expensive. The space is not nice. Uh, and there were, I mean, there's a series of, there's a fire uh, that kills a bunch of people. There's another incident where during a police raid, someone afraid of being caught jumps out a window and impales themselves on a fence. I mean, they really just awful, but also these were places of community and of togetherness for a lot of these people that didn't have many alternatives. And so they felt that the risk was worth the reward, or at least that these two things went hand in hand. And so when the police raid, there's some debate again, right? The history versus memory, What, why that night? Um, one of the things that happens that we know for sure is that the police start rounding up everyone who's uh, cross-dressing or any kind of deviance or anyone who's giving them any problems. And uh, the way the legend goes, one queen really starts giving an officer hell uh, and like headbutts him or something and the crowd cheers and she yells something, it's unclear, and then a bottle flies out of the crowd that like hits near an officer and then there you oh, go. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then there's of course also a lot of debate about who who threw that brick. I showed a picture of Marcia P. Marcia P. Johnson earlier. Some accounts say she's the first person to throw. Is it a brick? Is it a bottle? Um, somebody else. There, there's some accounts that say it's Craig Rodwell yells gay power. That's almost certainly not true. Uh, for, those certainly you, not for those of you, uh, Craig Rodwell um, uh, was a gay activist in, in New York and opened uh, one of the first gay bookstores uh, uh, called the Oscar Wilde book bookstore. Um, and he was certainly very much involved, but he was, but he was of a different class than the people you're t t talking about because he was le learned and he was, he had the means in order to uh, open a book bookstore. And he was very brave. He was a very brave man. Yeah, he, he was actively involved in the annual reminder and some of these other organizations. He did, um, I don't think he was there the first night, despite the, you know, mythos that he was. But one thing the Oscar Wilde bookshop had is a mimeograph machine in the back, which is a huge deal, uh, because he starts running off flyers and all sorts of other stuff. And I think he is one of, not the only, but he is one of the people that can be credited with the reasons why, right? There's maybe a hundred people or 50 people the first night, but then there's hundreds of people the second and third nights. And he is one of the people that was running off flyers and distributing material uh, and, and things of that nature. I mean, it's similar, you know, you can draw comparisons to all sorts of movements, right? But um, the Paul Revere and some of these other folks, right? During the American Revolution that had the printing press, they were invaluable to increasing information and awareness. And I think, um, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but that Rodwell has a very similar relationship with Stonewall. And, and, and again, we have to think about, and you as a professor of communication or, or certainly an expert in communication, we think about, as you think about Paul Revere in putting that communication, or you think about Rodwell with, with the mimeograph machine. And then we think about January 6th, um, uh, 2021, and how social media played a role in that. It really is all about mass communication, yeah. given the technology or the ability to get that message out. And that's really a major part of what it was about. Yeah, it's what it's what rhetoricians would call circulation, uh, the circulation of the idea. Uh, and it's something that the homophile movement really, uh, they were not particularly successful at recruiting members, but their infrastructure existed such that they had, right, these printed publications. They were able to contact thousands of people, um, which was not a large number compared maybe to like the, you know, early NAACP uh, mailing list or things of that nature, but compared to anything that had come before it was, uh, you know, several orders of magnitude larger. Sure. Um, so did you prepare something about the homophile movement? I know that we've talked about that some. 
Yeah, I did. Um, let me, whoops. Oh no, I've opened Chrome. That's not what I want. Okay, let me share my screen again. And then I can tell that we, as we feared slash joked, we are going to be top heavy. Let me get back into presentation mode. Yeah, so we've talked about a lot of these things. And so I don't need to maybe spend as much time as I would have otherwise uh, talking about the can rise we, of the- can we, can, can we just stop here? Because a lot of what we've talked about is represented in the collage. I mean, I see, I see Craig here. So just walk everybody through, through these images. Yeah, I'm not, I can't, uh, this was actually a pre-collage I found, but uh, so the upper left is the gay is good slogan. That's something that uh, Franklin Kameny coins. He admits to stealing it basically wholesale from Stokely Carmichael's Black is Beautiful. He saw it on TV. Uh, but this is really a moment of trying to reclaim uh, you know, what does it mean, the word gay, and, and as a descriptor and as an identity. Uh, in the middle top, you can see that's uh, Frank, uh, Franklin, or Frank Kameny on the right there. He's talking to, I think these are people that showed up to see one of the pickets or annual reminders. I mentioned that he was very controlling about who got to talk to the media and who got to talk to the public. Uh, as the main organizer, you'll be shocked to learn that he was one of the people that was allowed to talk to the media <laughs> uh, or to the or to the public, uh, so that's him. And then the third picture on the upper right is him uh, marching, wearing a suit. That's uh, that doesn't look like Independence Hall to me. So that might be from one of the earlier uh, picket series before they start the annual reminder in 1965. They stage a series of one-off pickets in front of the State Department, uh, the White House, and they talk about doing one in front of the headquarters of the UN, but I don't think they go through with it. It's raining or they don't have enough people or something. I can't remember. Uh, but that gives you a sense, right? They're walking in a circle. They're wearing their Sunday best. Uh, and then a close up of a similar shot in the lower left, that's Barbara Giddings. Uh, she was a more militant activist who was affiliated with the Daughters of Belitis and then uh, gets kicked out for being too militant and so works with Madison. She, at the time, this is taken as probably still the editor of the latter. Uh, to her left, I think, is uh, Randy Wicker. She, uh, Randy Wicker and uh, Barbara Giddings' partner, Kay Tobin, write a couple of books about the gay militant. Um, yeah. And then in the middle, uh, middle bottom is Kemeny talking to somebody. And then on the lower right is uh, Barbara Giddings talking to someone. This is a collage I found, but it does a nice job of really illustrating a lot of these things as we flip through some of these. I found a couple of pictures of Jack Nichols at the annual reminder. Uh, and it gives you a better sense as well, both that they're wearing suits, uh, that they're, they have these you know, official signs. I think a lot of these signs, or at least some of them were part of Kemeny's um, objects that when he died all went to the Library of Congress. So my understanding, I haven't been there yet because COVID has shut down all of their reading rooms, but my understanding is that they have actual signage. Uh, so so FYI, FYI, we do have some uh, company signs uh, at uh, Stonewall. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, it, yeah. I don't know um, how many are, how many exist or where they are. Uh, much of his archival material is dispersed. Um, yeah. Mostly what I think the Library of Congress has is stuff that was in his house or in his attic when he died. So I don't know how much he how much he kept. But then there's there's Jack Nichols, who we'll be talking about more. We already mentioned this, but the publications and the rise of visibility, we start to see language like revolt. Uh, and then this issue of the latter featuring uh, Ger von Braum is the first time uh, a lesbian woman is willing to put her face on the cover of a publication. There had been pictures of in profile in black and white or of their backs or whatever. But I just Right, there's this rising push for increased visibility, even if it's very particular. Uh, and then here's some better images. I saw someone in the chat had mentioned homophiles of Penn State. Uh, so I, I do have an image of them there. They're, uh, they're active on Penn State's campus for several years. Um, you can see on the left is uh, Frank County in the center holding the gay is good sign that he coins and then the top is an image uh, from the first Christopher Street Gay Liberation Day. It's alternately referred to as just Liberation Day or Gay Liberation Day. I don't think, th they got the permit like 90 minutes before they marched. Uh, 
So there's some debate about what the official name of it is. I think there probably says something on the permit, but I don't, I don't remember which one is. And, and of which. course, and of course, like any uh, good gay demonstration, there is a bit of humor in here. And so I love the one in Penn State with the sign that says, hi, mom, guess what? <laughs> no, there's, a, there's always some good, uh, there's always some winking. The one thing I'm working on, the chapter I'm working on right now is on the Daughters of Bolitis. And the, just the one quick fact that I love about this is they gave recognition awards to gay male allies and they called them sons of Bolitis or SOBs. Yeah. Uh, just, <laughs> but anyways, so th this just gives you a sense about, you know, sort of what this looks like. Now, the homophiles of Penn State is probably in the early to mid 1970s. Uh, they're active on campus a couple of years. This picture that I found was not dated, at least uh, where, where I found it, but it, it wouldn't have been around too terribly long because at some point the language of homophile stops being stops being used. Okay, that's the last image I have of the Jeff, homophile let, movement let itself. Me, let me, let me uh, interrupt you here for a second, just talk about some comments and, and some questions at this point. So uh, someone has pointed out that many of Kameny's uh, signs went to the Smithsonian and uh, that's absolutely true and it's great. And for those of you who uh, don't know her, uh, Catherine Ott, who is a curator at the Smithsonian has done really an amazing job and, and being sure of two things about the uh, Smithsonian uh, gay collection. Number one, it's preserved and number two, that it's presented. And so uh, we owe Catherine Ott a, a great uh, a degree of thanks for, for the work that she's done on that. Um, the question has been posed about, can you talk more about how these activists would mobilize on a moment's notice. A fascinating point about how these media technologies enabled certain kinds of organizing. And of course that, that goes to the comparisons that we think about today with our phones. And as I was talking before about the recent insurrection in, in January, about how information is being transmitted through our phones and, and through our computers. But man, for these guys, it was a lot of work. I mean, they had to create these flyers. They had they had to you know pr print them literally, and then they had to distribute them, and they they had to get that information out there. Yeah, and and for them, they also considered having a formal printed mailing list a real danger because if you got yeah. raided by the FBI and you had people's real names and mailing addresses there, that was I mean because they knew they were under surveillance from the FBI. Every one of the annual reminders has uh, people. In the audience or has people in the audience that are FBI agents. They're writing down license plates. They're writing down physical descriptions and taking pictures. Uh, and, and so there was some real concern. And I, I think it's a testament uh, to how effective they were at being able to contact and get people out, uh, despite the fact that virtually every name on the mailing list is a pseudonym. Uh, and many of their mailing addresses were PO boxes or dummy addresses. Uh, the fact that they were able to ship uh, these periodicals or magazines to as many people as they were is kind of stunning. So Charles uh, uh, Kaminsky, hello Charles, has posted a link up here. People should take a look at that. Um, and also about an excellent paper in his opinion about Stonewall and other events. Uh, that paper is is there. Uh, Madeline Nagel, do you know who Madeline is? That's my sister. <laughs> Hello, Madeline. Uh, how do you think about public memory or lack thereof about the pre-Stonewall civil rights era movements influences current uh, movements? So, so how much do how much how much do current um, activists, no matter what their point of view is, what have they learned from the gay movement? Yeah, that's a really fascinating question. It's actually, I think one of, as I continue to research and write, it's one of the real animating questions of the dissertation, because my argument would be that they've learned a lot more from the early homophile movements uh, than maybe people in the early 70s and 80s would admit or say they have. Now, certainly some of these groups are reacting to and responding to what they perceived to be the failures of the homophile movement. Uh, they're assimilationist, they're lowercase c conservative, uh, they tend to be focused on piecemeal and legal reforms, things of that nature. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of these people are learning very real lessons about activist tactics, about the importance of visibility, even if it's constrained, about uh, the different strategies of getting things done, about how uh, divergent groups start joining. So there's a real fear about having national organizations, but by the mid-1960s, you start to see all of these individual chapters 
organizing into regional groups. You have the ECHO, which is the East Coast Homophile Organization, NACHO, which is the North American Conference of Homophile Organizations, these groups that, um, I mean, they start to learn a lot of the lessons, I, I think that really lay the groundwork for some of these early move, uh, for some of the 70s and 80s movements. And a lot of these groups in the early 1970s, like the Gay Liberation Front, for example, uh, flame out very quickly because they don't have the kind of institutional uh, wherewithal that the homophile organizations did. And, and also because they're torn by a variety of different things. They're simultaneously trying to fight gay oppression. Uh, they wanna work with the Black Panthers. A lot of them are in the anti-war movement. Um, uh, there's a whole host, host of factors that happens. But I, so I think that, well, most of these groups would say, all we learned was what not to do about these early groups that um, some of these early people, right? I mean, that are involved in homophile organizations and bristle at it, nonetheless learn, I think, a lot of lessons that they become the leaders of the movement in the 70s and the 80s. And, and also, I, that, that's very well said. And also the other thing is, is that we also have to think about when you, when you are involved in one of these movements, what does success look like? Mm -hmm. And, and so we kind of go toward a path which is very transactional. So in the gay world, it was about getting rights for employment or getting rights for housing. And then it was getting rights for, for marriage. Mm -hmm. These guys 50 years ago could not have believed that within 50 years that the Supreme Court of the United States would give them civil rights or the right to marry. It was not within, it, and and for those for those who believe that that is a degree of assimilation, I happen to be one of those. That was that was not necessarily should have necessarily been a goal, but but that but that was sort of like the pinnacle of where they were going, where where the community went over the last twenty or thirty years, yeah. and and so it's defining where you want to go. Why is marriage better than anything else, or or equal rights across the, the board. But other groups can actually learn as from what um, the gay community has done from the Daughters of Belitis to uh, the decision in 2020 or 2019. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, uh, it's really kind of shocking, right? In some ways, how much progress was made so quickly. Um, and I, I think it's a testament to these folks who were obviously, we've said, I mean, they were problematic, right? But they nonetheless, I think were, it cannot be understated how radical it was to go out and say that you're gay, even wearing a suit. And of course we've, we're running, uh, we're running short on time. But one of the things that's so fascinating about Jack Nichols's life uh, is how willing he was to put himself out there. I mean, he writes his entire life publicly as an openly gay man. Um, and he's the first person to appear. He appears on a CBS special report. It's under a pseudonym, but it's his name and likeness in a video saying, I am gay and here I am wearing a suit and I'm normal. And I'm going to talk to the CBS, uh, do a sit down interview with like a CBS interviewer. Um, I mean, that, that is, that must have been so terrifying because you knew the FBI was watching you. And uh, in his case, his father gets fired uh, when they find out that his father's related to him. Now, his father was working for the FBI, which is a whole fascinating subcurrent. But um, yeah, you know, it, it, it's imperfect. I, I think most forms of activism are, but to understand sort of what these people were responding to, it's very easy to say, oh, how conservative today. And, and it was, but compared to what what their sort of situation was in which they were trying to be persuasive, it's fascinating. Um, how brave they were and, and sort of how much they accomplished as well. So we only, we, you're absolutely right. We only have a few minutes left. I want to get some of these other comments. As I said to you earlier in, the, in our warm up, we, there was like so much for us to t talk about. It would be yeah. crazy. So I have a question about you. So um, here you are sort of in the beginning parts of your career. You've, uh, you know, you, you've done a, a great job with the research and writing that you've done. Um, but now you've, you've understood and you've taken in and, and you've digested a lot of this. What role of, as an activist do you believe you play in your work? Hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, the easiest answer is I, I wish 
I wish more than I do, but, but I do think that recovery and analysis of these materials is activist work on its own. Um, I, the, I, do, the, I, I do too, FYI. I mean, I think you are a huge activist in the work that you do, do here. It's a huge contribution. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, the, you know, the tension between what does it mean to be an academic, an academic hyphen activist or, or vice versa, um, it is an ongoing one. It's one I think about a lot. There, uh, there always should.